Good morning. I'd like to start with another proof by exhaustion question. Um, and full disclosure, um, this is from the textbook. And when I first looked at this, I couldn't do it. Because um, with proof by exhaustion, you've either got a limited choice of numbers to try, or it's try it with odd, try it with even. That's certainly what we were doing um, in the last video on Friday. So um, here I was confused that there were three possible outcomes. So that implies that we need to be trying three different sorts of number. So odd, even, well, I didn't know what else. The trick was the fact there were three sorts of uh, condition here meant we needed to find um, a sort of number where there were three options. And it was all about multiples of three. So you have to consider the three options are um, Consider a multiple of three. So that would be 3n. And that's how we describe a multiple of three, going back to good old GCSE proof. You've then got one bigger than a multiple of three. So that would be 3n plus one. And then two bigger. than a multiple of three. And that would be, did I say two n a minute ago? I meant three n. Uh, three n plus two. Obviously three bigger than a multiple of three, you'd be back to another multiple of three again. So the number that we are cubing could either be a multiple of three, one bigger or two bigger. And all numbers fall into one of those categories. So we are cubing these numbers. Um, I'll do one for you. I'll do this one. 3n cubed. That's 3n times 3n times 3n. So that's 27n cubed. Now, is that a multiple of 9, one more than a multiple of 9, or one less than a multiple of 9? Well, if it's a multiple of 9, I can write it as 9 times something, and I can this one. Which is... A multiple of 9. So what you need to do is expand this and this. And of course, uh, in the last lesson, I was doing it by gridding it out, multiplying 3n plus 1 by 3n plus 1, and then expanding, um, multiplying it by 3n plus 1 again. But of course, you could use the binomial. You could use the binomial for this. So go and have a go. Um, see if you can work out 3n plus 1 cubed and 3n plus 2 cubed and then we'll reconvene in a minute when you've had a go at that. So I used the binomial, I remember that a plus b cubed, my powers of a go down, my powers of b go up and the coefficients, I can either use NCR or Pascal's triangle. So I had one lot of a cubed, three lots of a squared b, three lots of a b squared and one lot of be cubed. So I plugged uh, in that for a and that for b and got that. And then I plugged in uh, that for a and that for b and got that. Now I've already got the multiple of nine. So I'm hoping that one of these is one more and one of these is one less. Well, if I look at this one, this bit I can write as nine times something. plus the one at the end. So this is this plus one. So that's one more than a multiple of one. Sorry, multiple of nine. And then if I do the same for this, ignore the eight, um, I've got uh, nine lots of three n cubed plus six n squared plus four n plus eight. So that's a multiple of nine. If you add eight to a multiple of nine, you get almost to the next multiple of nine. So you're one less than a multiple of nine. So, which is one less than a multiple of nine. So therefore I have proved that all cube numbers are either that, that, or that. 
And that's the hardest proof by exhaustion question I could find. Three conditions, which was what got me on the multiple of three thinking. Two conditions, well, that's probably odd or even. And then the other sort you get are where you've just got a, a limited list of numbers. OK, so just to summarise the different sorts of proof we've come across. So we started with GCSE proof. So that's just going back to where we were at GCSE. Um, we then talked about proof by deduction. We have this sort of funny dance where we do some rough working and then we do it in reverse to show our solution. Um, not super crucial. I'm always disappointed when I see mark schemes. They don't insist on it, but I like to do it properly. Uh, we did proof of identities. That's where you got the triple equal sign, where you either work on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So you lock one side, work on the other side. And proof by exhaustion, which we've just done both on Friday and a little bit of today. So that just leaves us with one more sort of proof. Um, it's probably the easiest because it's not a proof. It's a disprove method. And all you need to do is disprove something by finding an example that doesn't work. OK, so I've got some examples here for my disprove by counterexample work. Prove that the sum of two consecutive prime numbers is not always even. Right, so I'm going to write down my prime numbers. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. So if I add two consecutive prime numbers, 2 plus 3 is 5. Bingo, I've got there already. Now actually, every other sum of consecutive prime numbers will be um, even because... Apart from two, all prime numbers are odd. But this is the counterexample. So that is the counterexample which shows that it is not always even. Um, go on. Can you come up with an integer that doesn't have an even number of factors? I mean, for example, six does have an even number of factors, doesn't it? Because you could do one times six and 2 times 3. I always think about factors in terms of multiplying. But can you find an example of one that doesn't have an even number of factors? Have a think about it while I pause. It's any square number. So 16, for example. So you can do 1 times 16, uh, 2 times 8, and 4 times 4. So 16 and any other square number has an odd number of factors. So that is your counterexample that disproves. And here's a slightly more complicated one. Um, can you come up with a value of n that means that this is not positive? 2n squared minus 6n plus 1. Pause the video and have a go. Well, yeah, I, I, I found two straight off, uh, one or two, uh, give you an answer that's not positive, anything bigger than that, and uh, you get into the positives. But if you want to show by means of a counterexample that it's not positive for all values of n, well, bingo, I got there straight away, and you could have had two as well, and there are other values you could have had. So by far the most common sort of proof by counterexample question is one like this, where they show you some student work, and they ask you to identify the error, and then it normally goes on to a counterexample type question. So in this one, the student's trying to prove that 1 plus x squared is less than 1 plus x squared. So the student has expanded the right-hand side and got that, and they are trying to convince us that this um, is always going to be bigger than that. So have a little think, what's the error? And can you provide a counterexample to show that this is not true? The student believes it is true. The student believes they have proved it is true. But can you see where they've gone wrong and find a counterexample to show that it is not true? OK, so it is very easy to think that this is bigger than this because it's got the 2x. And that's the mistake the student made because 
if x is negative, then this will make the right hand side smaller, it won't be bigger. So 1 plus x squared, the left hand side, is only less than 1 plus 2x plus x squared, the right hand side, when x is positive. Um, so my counterexample, I chose a negative number. So when x is 1, if I work out this side, I get 2. And if I work out, I can either use that or that, it's the same thing, I get 0. So in that case, and only in that case, uh, the left-hand side is bigger than the right-hand side, not what the student has said. So by finding a counterexample, I've proved the statement is not always true. And this thing about assuming something is positive is nearly always the, uh, the secret, nearly always the secret. So I have suggested um, two questions for you to try from the textbook. Um, now, I know you've got solution banks uh, available to you, but I'm going to do work solutions for both of these just because, um, you know, I, I think proof is quite hard to sort of get your head around. And, and I want to make sure that I'm giving you um, as good a steer as possible. Um, so I've attached those to class charts as well. And I'm going to leave it there, actually. I know I said I'd do two more videos this week, but actually that brings us to a nice sort of natural conclusion. So I'm going to stop there. Um, it's been a real pleasure preparing materials for you um, and helping out Mr. Gobber. I do hope that um, you've been able to keep up and I really look forward to, although I'm not going to be teaching you in September, I look forward to seeing you back in school and I hope that uh, we're going to be able to, uh, to pick up uh, and get back into the routine of normal lessons as quickly as possible. I have to say we are further ahead than we would have been had we still been in lessons because we've been able to switch to five hours or five lessons a week. Um, so, you know, we have made the best of a really difficult situation. And so for those of you who have kept up, um, well done, well done. Tomorrow, um, next year will be fine. So take care, have a good summer, and I will see you in September.